Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So here I have my Danax, one of my Danaxes from Tord at Thor's Forge. And um, one of the things that's happened recently is some comments have been coming in on some of my old videos, including a video I did about the house cars and the Danax. In fact, I did a series of videos a while ago, many of you will remember. And um, some people, I don't know why, with the, where the traffic's coming from, uh, presumably a forum or something, um, have been commenting on this as an anti-cavalry weapon. And I suppose the main question that is coming through is, do I think that the Danax was the Danish and Anglo-Saxon answer to Norman cavalry? Do I think it was an anti-cavalry weapon? Um, now I'm going to start off by answering that question as relatively concisely as possible by saying, no, I don't think it was. Now, that doesn't mean that it was or it wasn't. That's just my belief. Um, and I'm going to explain why. So first of all, the Danax to me is not particularly well set up to deal with cavalry. It is a not particularly long. Uh, in fact, this is probably as about as long as they ever got, uh, despite what you might see in some modern uh, kind of like Viking reenactment where it's become quite fashionable to have very, very long Danaxes. The actual um, iconography, so in other words, the evidence from artwork in, in period, and indeed the evidence from archaeology as well, suggests that this is about as long as Danax is generally got. It does seem that generally they were, you know, between four and five feet long. They weren't particularly long. So that's the first thing I think that suggests that Danaxes weren't really set up specifically as anti-cavalry weapons because I think if for an anti-cavalry weapon, you generally want something longer. The second reason that I think that they're not particularly anti-cavalry weapons is I don't think that this form of head is particularly, especially well suited to uh, taking on cavalry. Um, the fact is that it's not uh, got a projecting point at the top. I suppose you could argue that the top of the blade there can be used for thrusting. And of course it could be. But it's not particularly well adapted for opposing a moving horse, a charging horse, um, especially coupled with the fact that it's not a very long weapon. Um, and, you know, really, I mean, you could argue that, yes, OK, because it's like a giant cleaver, it would have a large effect on horse flesh. But what you really want to do with horse flesh is stop it or keep it away. You don't really want to be carving it up necessarily. And to use the Danax requires a fair amount of moving it. In general, it seems that the historical artwork of, of the period seems to show Danax is used in quite wide uh, chopping movements, which, yeah, as always, you could use them against a horseman but it doesn't seem particularly effective against cavalry who might be coming at you with um, you know, sword and shield or spear and shield and moving at speed. Um, and finally, <laughs> the most important, I think, reason why I don't think that this is an anti-cavalry weapon is because they already had anti-cavalry weapons. So they had spears. And when we look at any period of history, whether it's the 19th century with bayonets or whether it's um, you know, phalanxes in the classical world, um, we find that the best way of opposing, except for missile troops, the best way of opposing cavalry, even shiltrons in 14th century Scotland, the best way of, of, of opposing cavalry is with pikes or spears. So fundamentally, we know that during the time of the Battle of Hastings or the, the Viking era, the late Viking era, we know that the spear was pretty much the most common weapon. It was the sidearm of everybody from the, the sort of essentially the, the feared, the great feared, essentially levies um, of, of country, risen, country raised soldiers, um, citizen soldiery, militias essentially, right the way through to the professional house guards, the predominant weapon was the spear. And you'll see that from, so this one, you can't see because it's got an enormous reach. Okay, so I'm quite a long way from my camera. I'm probably about, uh, probably about nine feet away from my camera and you can see this is a nine foot long spear. Um, in fact, it's so long I can't stand it up in my garage and I do have quite a tall ceiling in here. So, you know, the spear is absolutely the best thing to keep cavalry at bay and you can easily um, wear a shield or carry a shield at the same time and it enables you to stab the horse, enables you to keep the horse away uh, it enables you to, you know, put the, the cavalry off, basically even coming close to you and attacking you. 
um, you can stab the rider, but perhaps most importantly as well, it means that if the cavalry are using lances, or in this period, in, in Hastings period, more kind of spears on horseback rather than lances per se, if they're using lances, it means that you can match their reach. And one of the things we see in later centuries, in the 19th century, I'll just put the spear down for a second, is that uh, it's a real problem if your infantry have less reach than the cavalry have. So we know, for example, Polish lancers in the 17th century used very long lances so they could outreach some of the infantry they were coming against. And coming back to the Danax, the problem is that if we see this as something to hit horses and horsemen with, well, all they need to do is just use spears. If they're using nine foot long spears or lances like I just was holding there, how are you ever going to get to the horse or the horseman? Because they're going to be stabbing at you by that point. Okay. Um, so this is what it really comes down to for me. Is, is the Danax a weapon that you could use against a horse and a horseman? Well, yes, of course. And we see this in the Bayer Tapestry. We know that this was done. And I think the fact that it's shown on the Bayer Tapestry and the fact that it is described in the written sources of this period, some people think, oh, well, it's an anti-cavalry weapon. But no, just because a sword is used against a horse doesn't make a sword an anti-horse weapon. It just means it's a weapon. And like lots of weapons, it got used against horses. And, you know, the, the Danaxes are mentioned in the written sources probably because they're quite an exotic weapon for the time. You've got to remember that for centuries, the standard weapon for pretty much everyone from the bottom of society to the top was the spear. So this was the normality. When these uh, feared housecarls come along with their big two-handed axes, well, of course, the writers want to talk about them and the fearsome effects of them because they're unusual. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I think it is. Personally, what do I think the Danax was for? I think it was had a similar role to the Montante or Zweihander or Spadone, like behind me. I think they were primarily the weapons of champions. They were the weapons used by, in some cases, nobility in this period, in some cases, the personal bodyguards of nobility. They are the big F-off weapon that is designed to uh, instill fear but also perhaps used by your forlorn hope, by your, the people who are going to charge into breaches and kill as many of the enemy uh, as possible before dying gloriously themselves. But they are also used as support weapons, where the majority of people in the army are using spears and shields, and they're fighting in the lines, they're doing the things they normally do, keeping off the cavalry, fighting against the other spearmen. And then you've got a few specialist troops with these sorts of weapons who are looking for those openings uh, where they can crash through a gap and smash someone through the helmet or where they can lop someone's legs off or where a horseman is already being taken on by spearmen and is occupied with those spearmen and the axeman can run around the side and lop the horse in half, lop the head off the horse or chop the leg off the rider or whatever. So I think these are shock and awe weapons that are used as part of a weapon system uh, with the other weapons, the archers and the spearmen, and the, in some cases the horsemen, who are fighting in that, the majority, making up the majority of soldiers in that military force. So these are the kind of, if you could describe these, these are the, you know, uh, light support weapons or whatever. They, these, are the, these are the unusual things which come in and deal out huge amounts of damage where it's not expected or hold the flanks of spearmen and this kind of stuff. So there we go. Um, do I think this was an anti-horse weapon? No, I don't. I think it was just a weapon, just the same as the sword. The sword was a weapon that was sometimes used against horsemen. The axe or Dane axe was a weapon that was sometimes used against horsemen, but wasn't specifically designed for that. To me, the weapon which was specifically designed for the majority of combat and definitely for holding off horses in this period was the spear. And if you want to find a weapon, the best weapons for um, kind of nullifying the effects of cavalry, history has taught us the answer. Pikes and missile fire, so arrows or, or bullets. Um, and this is how you stop cavalry. The Danax is not a mystical weapon to stop cavalry charges. And of course, at the Battle of Hastings, we even if it had been, it didn't work, did it? Because we know that the cavalry uh, whilst it took them all day, the ca Norman cavalry was very successful at the Battle of Hastings and heavy cavalry went on to dominate the battlefield for hundreds of years after that. 
I hope you've enjoyed watching this. Uh, give me a like and a subscribe if you haven't done already, and I'll see you really soon for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.